Good morning. I read this morning from Joel, inspired by God, speaking to us, who said that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Pray with me. Father, we bow before you this morning as we begin our time of worship and ask, Lord, that you pour out your spirit on us. We are here to worship. We are here, Lord, to bless you. For we know that even in blessing you, we shall be blessed ourselves. You've promised us, Lord, to be with us where two or three are gathered, and indeed we are here in your name to worship. Help us to set aside the cares of the world and the thoughts of the day to focus our attention on you. You are worthy of our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. A few announcements for you this morning. First of all, a concert this evening over at Sun City, a concert that, um, well, it will introduce you to what's going to happen on the uh, cruise. Some of, we've got our choir and many others going on a cruise next month, uh, and I can just imagine being on that cruise, but they wouldn't let me go. Sorry about that. Uh, but um, a friend of mine, Nancy Hill, I know her from other places, and uh, Scott Cameron are going to be key leaders in that, but our, our uh, choir and others will be singing. So tonight at 6 o'clock over at Sun City. need you to know, too, that uh, all of us uh, should be planning for the end of this journey. Um, they say Sun City is right next door to eternity, so you need to be prepared. Uh, I, I like to say I'm prepared, but I'm not ready. I've got a few more things I want to do, but uh, helping you to be prepared. Uh, start, starting Tuesday afternoon, 1 o'clock over at Sun City, we have four events to help you prepare for the end of this life, your transition to eternity, so sign up for that. Uh, people are on the table, out the door and to the right. Know, too, that there are two tables, or tables set up for Living Water International. We've been working with Living Water for seven or eight years, been on numerous trips, mostly to Central America, to help bring clean water to uh, small villages all along the uh, Central American uh, Avenue. And we also have the opportunity to teach them not only how to use that clean water, to live a healthier life, but we teach them too, tell them about how they can have a relationship with Jesus Christ, who is uh, the living water. So um, we'd love to have a few more people sign up to go on that trip. The uh, trip is in February, but the sign up, we need to do that very soon. And note too that there's a table set up for the Hidden Disabilities Ministry, which is a ministry to help people and families uh, who are struggling with mental health issues. Uh, I think the statistic says that in America, one out of five of us will be diagnosed with a mental illness. So just look around you. And um, if it's, yeah, there, there you go, right? Um, and and that is, that's a good, good chuckle, good laugh. But mental illness is surely not, is it? It is very common. Things like Depression. Depression can lead toward uh, suicidal thoughts and suicidal behaviors. Uh, bipolar, uh, uh, people who have these tremendous mood swings between, you know, all excited and working away and everything uh, to going very downhill very fast, uh, bipolar. Uh, things like that. Anxiety, we like to call it just worrying, but anxiety when it begins to uh, disrupt your life. Mental illness is a very serious situation, and we have a ministry for that. So they're on, they're on the table uh, immediately out the door to the back back there. And I also want to let you know some good news, I think, that the CDs that we promised are now available out um, there at the Welcome Center, which is out by, near the coffee pot. These are uh, CDs of me singing to tracks and to uh, piano by Lynn Lee, All to Him I Owe is the title of that. There are, I think, 18 songs on that. It is free. You can take uh, one or take more if you want, but know this, that uh, if you will make a contribution to the debt fund retirement, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, we are at 90, oh, excuse me, $922,000 is all we lack, 
So if you'll pay about $1,000 for that, um, uh, that's funny too, but I, I, I know of three people who've already done so, so um, follow in their footsteps. And uh, again, it's to pay off the debt on our property here, uh, 922000 We want to see how, how we can do. Um, I, I want to say thank you too to Karen Quillen. There's Karen. Wave your hand. There's Karen. Uh, she, she is one of the staff members, support staff members over at the Sun City campus, but uh, she has been the one to help get all this work to get. A lot of work has gone into this, not just in the recording of it, but copying and creating the cover and uh, all the things that have to happen to, to make that available to you. Know that there are CDs available now, and there will be flash drives in the very near future for those of you who don't have a CD player, and maybe your automobile has what we call a flash drive, thumb drive, uh, USB drive, or wh whatever it is. You can uh, copy these to your iPhone even and play it from, well, your smartphone. It doesn't have to be an iPhone. but uh, it, These are um, for people who like to hear me sing. I uh, hope you enjoy. For those uh, who have rodent problems in your home, uh, I understand that if you'll play this for a couple of hours without... Uh, any pauses that um, you can run rodents away. So try that. Again, they are free. You are not paying for the CD. You're making a contribution to the uh, debt retirement for us. Those are all of the announcements this morning, I think. And so um, I turn it over to Brother Paul and ask him to make us welcome this morning. Okay. Thank you so much, Pastor. So if you'll stand, please. Turn around to somebody near you and shake their hand. Hug their neck. Tell them how glad you are that they're here. We're going to sing a little song, all right? Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place when we all
our name he knows each one of us he formed our hearts and before even time began my life was in his hands Amen. I have a maker he formed my Scripture reading this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. I invite you to read with me. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. 
The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Pray with me. Father, we know that you speak to us, and we want to hear you speak to us today. We've gathered. We exalt you. We acknowledge that you are here and who you are. And we listen. Thank you for speaking to us in such a way that we can understand. And specifically, through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who came and lived among us to demonstrate your love toward us and demonstrate just how great is your love and mercy and grace in that he died for us. Father, we praise you for who you are, for demonstrating yourself to us so that we can know you personally and in a way that brings salvation to our hearts and lives. Father, we come now to present our offering to you and ask, Lord, that you receive these as a token of our love for you. We want, Lord, everything that we have and all that we are to be devoted to you. Lord, may our act of giving be a symbol of just the fact that we are devoted to you. Lord, we pray for our country, for the freedom that we enjoy, and for those who make that possible for us. We ask, Lord, that your hand be upon this nation, and especially as we again enter into that time of selecting leadership for our country. Lord, we would pray for a great revival in our land. You've promised us through your word that if your people, the ones called by your name, will humble ourselves and pray, then you'd hear from heaven. Lord, we pray that you'll hear, that you'll hear us repent, that you'll hear us turning back to you, and that you'll heal this land, for we long to be a nation, one nation under God. Lord, we pray, too, that uh, those who are struggling today with life circumstances and situations would sense your presence and power in their lives. Lord, we thank you. We bless you. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a song called There's a Stirring. There's a stirring deep within me. Could it be my time has come when I'll see my gracious Savior Face to face when all is done Is that his voice I am hearing Come away my precious one Is he calling me Is he calling me I will Savior, face to face when all is done, is that his voice I am hearing, come away my precious one, is he calling me, is he calling me, I will
That will definitely be the love boat, won't it? <laughs> wow, love that music. And with no instruments. Wow, what a blend. Nice. You probably have heard someone say to you recently, watch your step. It's a common expression around here, a warning, if you will, and wisely taken, I'm sure. Because we know that it doesn't take much to stub your toe and down your go and who knows what from there, right? In fact, some of you may be recovering from a fall. In recent weeks, I've seen smashed faces and broken knees and hips and things. Falls are, well, they're very dangerous. Watch your step. That could also be true for the spiritual life as well. Watch your step. For we, as Christians, have chosen to Walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Follow Jesus. Wherever he leads, I'll go, we sing. And we know, as Christians, that following Jesus oftentimes is a very exhilarating, exciting, and life-fulfilling experience. But we know, too, those of us who've been walking with Jesus for a while, that it can be challenging, at times even painful to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. This series of sermons that I'm sharing with you over the next several months is about following in the footsteps of Jesus, uh, literally, geographically, in the sense of, um, that is, we want to go where Jesus went when he was on this earth in, in fleshly form as you and I are today. And last week, we went to Bethlehem to see uh, where he was born. And this week, we go to, well, we leave Bethlehem. And we follow him on a difficult journey because, um, well, um, his footsteps were difficult even in the earliest of days. We follow him south from Bethlehem all the way to Egypt. But we'll be back. In Matthew chapter 2, the gospel says that when they, the wise men, that is, had gone, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, and take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And so he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where they stayed until the death of Herod, and so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. And then I skip a few verses down to verse 19, chapter 2 of Matthew. After Herod died... An angel of the Lord appeared to, in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. And so he got up, took the child and his mother, and they went to the land of Israel. But when he, Joseph, heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town named Nazareth, and so was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. Pray with me. Father, we bow before you to ask to, to speak to us. Even as you spoke to Joseph, Lord, so long ago, you directed him in his life in the steps that he should take. We pray that you will direct us in our steps today, we listen, Lord, for your voice that we might obey. Amen. Someone might call Joseph a dreamer, but certainly not like the word is being used today, dreamers, the daydreamers. You sit around and work, uh, sit around and dreaming instead of working. I'm not talking about that. A, a dreamer in the sense that, well, God spoke to Joseph by way of an angel, as, Jesus, as Joseph was sleeping, dreaming. 
That was not uncommon, and I would assume it's not that uncommon today. God speaks to us. Some of you are doing a great Bible study, just started a few weeks ago, right? Experiencing God. And one of the things that you'll be learning that Blackaby, Henry Blackaby taught us is that uh, God speaks to us by His Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal Himself, His purposes, and His ways. God speaks. God speaks, and so Joseph was one who would uh, hear from God. Indeed, he did. Uh, Joseph did just that multiple times, heard God, and you'll notice what Joseph did each time. He obeyed. He heard God's Word, and he obeyed God's Word and did what God said do. Here's a picture of a couple of kids. Maybe it gets your attention that says, um, this one on the right says, uh, something's not right about this. Why is my piece of cake so small compared to my brother, right? We say, life's not fair, as if it's supposed to be. <laughs> we want it to be, don't we? We want life to be fair. We want to get our part, just like this younger fella. He's, he wants his fair share of the cake. But we know, we've, we've experienced enough birthdays to know, life is not fair. Somebody said, um, you want fair? Well, it comes to town in October, <laughs> and then it leaves. We know enough about life to know that, well, life's just not fair. And justice is seldom served in this world. In fact, it was Martin Luther King who enjoyed quoting Amos chapter 5, verse 24, where he said, let justice roll on or down like a river. Righteousness like a never-failing stream. That, oh, that would be the wonder, wouldn't it? If, if the day comes when righteousness and justice prevail. But just watch the news. We know that um, righteousness and justice, well, they're a rare commodity, it seems. There's so much unrighteousness and injustice in the world. We may aspire to have that kind of fairness and justice to prevail, but truth is, uh, it's uncommon. There is no utopia where everything is hunkadory. No heaven on, on heaven and earth. That is, it's um, it, it may we may want heaven on earth, but it it just seldom happens. We fight an endless struggle against evil and suffering and injustice, cruelty all, all around us. It's everywhere. The life of Jesus, I think, sort of epitomizes this injustice. Here he was, the Son of God perfect lamb of God, and Herod wanted to kill him. Herod wanted to kill him because Herod felt um, that the young Jesus would try to take his place. He loved, that is, Jesus loved everyone, but not everyone loved him back. And so it was that he was mistreated from the very get-go, from the time of his birth, that even though he loved everybody and treated them fairly, uh, Satan and evil and, and injustice uh, had Jesus in the crosshairs from the very beginning to do him in because Jesus represents for us all that is good in the world. From the beginning of his earthly life, Jesus faced this opposition, opposition to evil and personified in old King Herod, the personification of evil itself. In fact, um, Herod... Here's an image of him. Nice looking fellow, huh? In fact, in uh, his twisted mind, this uh, Christ child was a threat to him and uh, a reason for Herod to try to kill the boy. And so it is that this urgent departure, a nighttime departure at that, from Bethlehem down to, um, to Egypt. And some would say, well, why in the world go to Egypt? Why, why leave the country? Well, to get out of the rule, the reign, the region of Herod the Great who wanted to kill Jesus. And Well, it would be uh, from Bethlehem, just right directly south down to Egypt. And who knows what that um, may be. Um, Joseph and Mary had relatives there. There were many Jews in Egypt. In fact, during, after the years of Alexander the Great, um, I understand that there were thousands and thousands of Jews who were encouraged and, and moved into the 
area of the country, especially along the Mediterranean border, including the city of Alexandria. Many, many Jews, maybe they had relatives there. But that stay in Egypt was not long. According to the story that we have here, not long ago, not long would they stay there, and, and the word again comes to Joseph, yet still again in the form of a dream, and angel speaking to him, and says that the one who wanted to kill you, or the ones, are dead. Herod had died. 4 B.C., we're told that he died, and when he died, his kingdom was divided into four different areas. In the area of uh, Judea, the area uh, that would include Jerusalem and Bethlehem, from whence Joseph and Mary and Jesus had uh, moved to Egypt. Uh, that was under the control of Archelaus, the first son of Herod. And wouldn't you know it, that Herod's first son had the same reputation Herod did. Just a mean dude. And so Joseph, it said, was uh, fearful of going there. And so God says, well, just keep moving. And off they went to Galilee, further north. Um, that was area was controlled by the second son of Herod, Antipas. He had a bit better reputation, and so that's where they lived. Sounds like Herod was one messed up dude, both in his head and in his heart. Some would argue that maybe he suffered from paranoia, that he was thinking that somebody was always out to get him, to take his place. He, um, he was messed up, in, in some, and I can't help but wonder... What, how, whatever, whatever happened to Herod that made him turn out that way? You ever think about that? You see somebody on the news or you hear about somebody's life and you wonder what happened that, yeah. Science tells us that partly it's, you know, it's, it's, we're born with something. You know, we're not a born a blank slate, but a lot of who and what we become depends on our nurture. That is how we're cared for or not cared for as a child. And then there's all these situations and circumstances of life, things that happen to us. And someone said, well, it's not the things that happen to us, but how we respond to them that really makes all the difference in the world. Well, could be. What do you do when bad things happen? I've, I've been amazed at watching people in my lifetime to see how similar kinds of experiences can happen to two different people, and one responds with, we'll make it through, we'll make it through by God's grace, we'll, and others just get smashed down. They, they don't have the capacity to get up and dust themselves off and keep moving. Or other, one will say, oh, well, you know, at least I'm still up and going. And others will say, God did this to me, I'm angry. And they'll be bitter and angry for the rest of it. How is it that two people respond so differently? Well, it is a very complicated question and a complex answer, I would assume, but uh, we do know that Herod, whatever the, consequ whatever the input, the output was, he wanted to kill Jesus. And he died, they say, a very um, sad death. In fact, the history, as I understand it, is that he rounded up a bunch of people, um, people who were well thought of, and said, when I die, kill all these people so that there will be grieving in the community. Because he knew no one would grieve for him. They'd all be, yay, he did. The wicked witch is dead. Do you know anybody like Herod? You know, I'm, the, the, the further down this path I walk, the more I come to the understanding of there but for the grace of God go I. When I hear about these people doing all these awful things, I wonder what happened to them. Is it the fact that they are so evil? Or is it, how did they get that way? Our personality, our character develops as we respond to these things in life. We make our choices, and then our choices make us. So Jesus, you know, remember when, when, um, when the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, and we, we recite the Lord's Prayer. But part of that says, and, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We should always pray that prayer. Lord, uh, keep us on the right path. We don't want to run into 
temptation and the evil that comes along, Lord, keep us safe. And indeed, we should pray that prayer. Um, we want to follow Jesus. And the truth of the matter is, it seems to me that if we're not following Jesus, we're following the devil. We're going to follow somebody. There's always a cost to following. If you follow the devil, there's the cost there. We all know that. But if you follow Jesus, there will be a cost as well. In fact, here's what the Scripture says in regard to that. Matthew 16, 24. Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. There's a cost to following Jesus. I've heard it many times in my career as a chaplain and a pastor. People tell me about their life experience and becoming a Christian. So oftentimes I've heard these stories about how, you know, when they were um, you know, living for themselves and living a wild life and those just all kinds of wanton pleasure and whatever, that um, things were just going great. But there was this void in their hearts and in their lives and, and the Holy Spirit convicted them of their, their need for a Savior. They gave their lives to Christ and it all just went crashing down. That since they became a Christian, they'd lost all their popularity and they'd lost, maybe lost their wealth and all that kind of stuff. Why is it that when you choose to follow Christ, bad things happen? And someone has explained it like this. That as long as you're walking with the devil, he's not going to bother you. <laughs> In fact, he's going to encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. But you make the decision in the path to follow Christ instead of walking in the way of the world, and the, the devil is going to see if he can change your mind. He's going to try to make it hard on you. I'm not sure how all that works, but I do know this, that Jesus has called us, come, follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. A cross is not a, something to be hung around our necks. In fact, he bids us come and die. Die to self in order that we might live to Christ. The fight to Satan, the, the fight with Satan is not a battle that we can win. But it is a battle that Jesus has already won on our behalf. He did that victoriously. His presence in our lives is what gives us a victory. So if, if uh, we might think of Herod as evil personified, then Jesus would be good personified, would he not? You want to know what a good person looks like? Look to Jesus. He was always about healing and helping and giving hope and life to those around him. Always trying to help people um, do better. To follow Jesus means we, we face the same kind of opposition he did. And certainly when Jesus was ministering here on this earth, there were many opposed to him. And for all kinds of reasons, um, Jesus faced opposition. The world, the devil... Uh, we, we also have something that Jesus, I assume, did not have, and that is our sinful nature. We're born with it. It is our bent, we call it. We, if if you, uh, you put us in a perfect place, and we'll mess it up real quick. <laughs> you know the story about the two sets of footprints in the sand, don't you? Well... Imagine that there's two sets of footprints. There's one that's the footprints of Jesus, and we, we choose to follow that. But there's another set of footprints, and they're always enticing us. Come, go this way. Come, follow me. And it, it's always, it, it appears that, the, you know, this other path is a little easier. It's a little, well, maybe more rewarding. Uh, it, it's quicker and sweeter. It's the world trying to lure us away from walking the straight and narrow path. Those other footprints, those other paths, those other choices, um, they, uh, they may look good, but they lead to a place of destruction and death and darkness, and we don't want to go there. So here's Joseph and Mary and Jesus. Uh, they move to Nazareth. They avoid um, Archelaus. And his situation, much like his father, and they go further north up to Nazareth and, and they live there. We don't know much else except for this one occasion when Jesus is 12 years old. You remember that story? They, they go to the Passover, celebrate Passover down in Jerusalem. 
It would be a few days' journey for them, you know, traveling along to, to go from Nazareth down to Jerusalem, celebrate the Passover and go back home. Uh, Jesus is 12 years old, and the story says that they were on their way home, and where's Jesus? Where'd you? Well, they turned around, went back to Jerusalem, found him, and he says, didn't you know I'd be here in my father's house? Got to be about his business. He was, he was in the temple. And then the scripture says in regard to him that he went, he, that is Jesus, went down. Now, when we say down, um, literally it is down, although it's going north. You know, we typically look at the map and north is up, right? And so you go up, we'd go up from here to Dallas, right? Well, if you go up from Jerusalem to Nazareth, you wouldn't say go up, you go down because two things. Um, Literally, it would be downhill. And second, it would be um, Jerusalem is the, it's, it's the high spot. It's, it's the place to be, it's religiously, spiritually. And so you go down. So you go up to Jerusalem. You go up to worship. You go down. So they, he, Jesus, went down to Nazareth with them, was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with men. Just a snapshot. Not a movie, uh, n- not a journal, just a little snapshot. Jesus, 12 years old, at the temple, and uh, he's following in the footsteps of his heavenly Father. He is teaching men to know the heavenly Father. He followed the footsteps of his Father so we can follow in his footsteps to the Father. It's a trail, a path. A journey that can be challenging sometimes, rewarding, frightening, exhilarating, exhausting. I mean, those of you who've been walking with Jesus know that sometimes it's tough. Sometimes it is. In fact, you you may have come to the place where you have questioned, can I make it? Can I make it through this difficulty? And then you're reminded the Spirit speaks to you and says, I'm with you always. I promise never to leave you, never forsake you. Here's the way Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 10. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. A way out so that you can endure it. I think that means a way through it, doesn't it? Not to escape it, not to avoid it, but through it. As King David would say in Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Oh, I'm sure that there are many, many stories here in this room of people who have been through it. And you can testify that Jesus was with you all the time. I've been through some similar kinds of things in my life too. And I've discovered that there were times in my journey, that I felt, God, where are you? I don't sense your presence. Help me. And it was only when I got to the other side, only when he got me through the other side, that was able to look back and say, oh, now I can see that you were with me. But in that moment, I couldn't. Just because you feel, just because we feel alone in a circumstance or situation doesn't mean we're alone. He is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you're able to bear. No matter what Satan may come dumping at your doorstep, don't give in to him. God will provide a way out so that you can endure it. And I am concluded that life is not fair, but God is good. Indeed, He is. And when we experience injustice or unfair circumstances in life, remember, not only is God good, but God's in control. And whatever He allows to come our way, He will redeem for His glory. God causes all things to work together for good. Together, we will follow Jesus' footsteps. We do it as a family. We're not walking alone. We're walking together, one step at a time. Isn't that a good, I'm sure there is a song 
that says you'll, you'll never walk alone. God is with you, and your family is with you. Isn't, isn't that one of the blessings and benefits of the church, the family of God? You don't have to walk alone. But you do have to say, brother, and sister, I need your help. Life's not fair. God is good. And we like to say that God is good all the time. Yes, He is. So whatever you're going through right now, just claim it. God, I know you're with me. I know you love me. I know this church family loves me. I am not alone. I will make it through because you love me. And God has defeated the enemy in our lives. So watch those footsteps. Watch those footsteps. Some of you have, um, you've been in the military and you learned to do that drill and ceremony. I remember it was 44 years ago uh, this month that I was down at Lackland Air Force Base uh, in basic training, learning to be uh, an airman. And part of that was learning to, to march in, in formation. Uh, I, I still have not figured out how it makes sense that they want to put all those long-legged fellows up front and we and the normal people have to keep up with them in the back. Yeah. Some have said, Kelly, you walk so fast. I was in the military 40 years and keeping up with those long-legged fellows, what do you mean? You got it. But I do remember those early days trying to learn to stay in step, you know, with the fellow in front of you and the fellow beside you and... Um, and the, 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 the uh, temptation was always to look down. But you don't need to look down because you've got a fellow out front calling cadence. He's telling you when your heel should hit the ground. Joseph, he heard God in a dream and he obeyed. We walk not by sight but by faith in this world. Do you hear God? Come follow me. Father, we bow before you and we give you thanks for who you are in our lives and we choose to follow you. We know, we've heard you say that life will not be easy. The path is sometimes rocky and difficult and uh, frightening. But we're never alone. You, you're always behind us. You're always ahead of us. You're always beside us. You're, you surround us with your presence. And no, although sometimes we can't sense your presence, Lord, by faith we know that you are with us and we trust you. And so, Father, we say thank you. And we pray for our brothers and our sisters, some of whom may be walking a very difficult path right now. And they're struggling just to hear your voice. They're struggling to see your footprints in the sand and know where to step next. Lord, we pray that we would be aware. We would come alongside. We would encourage and we would, we would give strength to those who are struggling. That we could be the church, the body of Christ, so that no one ever walks alone. We pray for those who are struggling today and for those of us who... Uh, seem to be walking just fine we're all walking together and we're all walking to the same pace the same journey the same destination we look forward to seeing you father in all of your radiance and your glory yea though we walk through we will come to you father by your grace in jesus name amen i've asked paul to lead us in a song we call it a time of invitation if if you'd like for me to pray with you or counsel with you, I'll be here for just a few moments. It may be that today's, you know, you, you've got somewhere else you've got to be or you're not sure, then take one of those connect cards and just say, uh, put a note on there. Kelly, I'd like to talk to you sometime soon. Call me. Um, and, and you can either leave it in the, the seat right where you are or hand it to me on the way back uh, out, of the, out of the building. I'll be glad to do that. Make time to, to visit with you and pray with you and pray for you. But know that you're never, never walking alone. Just as I am.
follow the person in front of you. Who is that? Jesus. Jesus. May God bless you as you stay in step with Jesus. He's, uh, he's all around you. He's got you covered today. God bless you as you go. Be a sunshine in somebody else's life today. Amen. All right. Because of your love, we're forgiven. Your love.